Pazuzu help me because God left the chat! <laughs> I knew the second this thing butted into my recommended tab like a Karen going back in a Starbucks to demand the manager because her caramel macchiato had an eighth of a pump of sugar-free toffee syrup missing that this was going to be a bad one. Everyone since 2018 when the Not So Awesome document dropped or even 2019 when Doug Walker made the most tone-deaf album recreation has cottoned on to just how much his craft has stagnated and how the older videos have sprung several leaks. But this review, this review, you poor bastards picked a ripe one. Look, I'm no stranger to bad nostalgia critic content. Wait, that's a bit redundant. It's what started getting my channel traction after all. To get everyone up to speed, I started my foray into the Doug Walker doesn't understand genre in 2019, beginning with showcasing that Doug doesn't understand the Sonic OVA from 1996 that was later dubbed to English in 1999. I then showed he doesn't understand the Powerpuff Girls movie from 2002 or Gorillaz because the two became more closely tangentially related because of the lore of 2018's The Now Now album, and came back to his refusal to understand Sonic and his sibling rivalry review of the 2020 movie. I had to do a double review of his Osmosis Jones video because he doesn't understand the difference between physiology and psychology and didn't give a shit, repeatedly claiming it was inside out before inside out and somehow worse. And I've also done a couple lightning rounds on Disney Simbers where something he misrepresented or didn't understand was so major it royally pissed me off. The playlist containing these and videos by others will be linked in the end card and description box for you to check out at your leisure. So now fast forward to this video you're watching right now and the next one on the chopping block is his video on the 2011 film Rango. This thing dropped on January 19th, 2022 and it took me a whole ass year to get to it because I got tangled up with a lot of bullshit 2022 through my way. Before it gets twisted around, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make myself very clear by saying that as long as an opinion is presented in a respectful and well-defended manner, I can still comfortably agree to disagree if it's something I take the opposite stance on and I'll engage in discussion to see where that's coming from. Dog Walker is not respectful or knows what a good defense is. Any points I might have agreed with or relented on were too few and far between and often got immediately shot in the head because of his own incompetence and inflated sense of grandeur of ideas he wanted to see instead of what the movie was doing. Saddle up, cowpokes. This is gonna be one of the toughest yet. Normally, I start out by going over the opening interlude and sketches, but this time, we're gonna do something different. Let's start with that thumbnail. Yeah! Yes, this is real. And no, I don't know why Doug thought it was a good idea to Photoshop his ugly mug onto a chameleon head. It's pure nightmare fuel, and I don't believe anyone in their right mind would look at this and think, yeah, this looks good to go. Print. Back in the day, even if I don't like the depictions shown in them, the thumbnails were actual drawings by an artist who goes by the screen name Marobot. They lend themselves to Doug insisting on doing over-the-top, goofy expressions better than just mugging the camera because what works in a drawing doesn't always pan out in reality. The most I could find as to why Marobot no longer does the thumbnail art is that he asked for a raise and the walkers and Mike Mashad cut off all contact with him. Allegedly, he was only making $10 per thumbnail and considering the quality and skill of Marobot's work, that's criminally underpriced. Anyone who disagree with this, you're probably the kind of person who tries to haggle commission artists to lower their prices because you think you're above the artist or you offer to pay them in exposure. Either way, you're a dick. As for the thumbnails that Doug has himself photoshopped in, most of them don't have anything wrong with them beyond the camera mugging, but when he tries to put himself in place of another character, it doesn't always work. Like, look at this thumbnail for the Powerpuff Girls movie review. He had himself photoshopped in as Mojo Jojo, but besides looking obvious, he or the thumbnail creator didn't do a very good job of isolating the helmet because you can see the tips of Mojo's ears from the cropping job. As a quick aside, Doug isn't the only offender of over-the-top camera mugging thumbnails. There's a lot of channels that do this, and for the love of donuts and everything that is holy, I need you to stop that. It's uncomfortable to look at and only makes your clickbaity videos more obvious they're clickbait. At least that Nightmare Fuel thumbnail 
Well, we'll keep you awake long enough to get through the sketch they decided to put before the credits. No, your eyes and ears are not deceiving you. Doug decided to have a sketch featuring Tamara and Malcolm playing out how he thought Rango went into production, and it goes on for a full minute. It's a painful sketch where Tamara can't pull off acting as Gore Verbinski talking to Malcolm as the CEO of Nickelodeon in 2010, who, from what I could dig up, was not a black man, but an Iranian-American woman named Kaima Zargami. And rattling off how this film took a year to produce, which, Doug, animation takes a while, go fuck yourself. And what tropes they pack into this movie and it being a kid's film, which, okay, the kid's film thing. I am going to take that claim and save it for later. You know it's going to be good when someone has to do that. But wait, there's more. If you think that we're just going to jump right into the opening interlude laying the film out on the table, nope. Video goes on for another minute and a half talking about tropes. Now, I will relent that he does have a point about certain tropes and tropes being used. They're tools, after all. And they can be used effectively, or they can completely screw everything up. Just like how using a chef's knife can be used to cut celery, or it can be used to cut fingers. I'm also not saying that you can't be pissed off if a certain trope shows up that you happen to loathe. Hell, I myself have tropes that I don't even like seeing, and I try to look into what it is about the trope I don't like. Which is a standard that I hope and recommend people aspire to. Maybe it's the execution, maybe it's just bad from the get-go, maybe it's just that overdone, or maybe there's other aspects of what makes the trope tick. Sometimes for the trope as a whole, and sometimes in a case-by-case -case basis. Doug talks about the liar revealed being one of his most hated tropes, and let's just say that having knowledge of what was revealed in the not-so-awesome document made me go a little over-analytical on this. Like, I get why people hate The Liar Revealed. When it's done poorly, you know the reveal is coming from a mile away, and the only reason it goes on for that long is because the surrounding characters have the IQ of a banana, or it makes the story morally reprehensible. I have another theory as to why this is, and that's when a good Liar Revealed plot comes up, it unwittingly holds up a mirror to Doug and shows him the ugly truth he refuses to accept. That would be that Doug really is a sham whose act really does hurt people around him, but he'd rather ignore it because of his own narcissism. And when people naturally blue screen a death in response, he can't stand it because HOW DARE YOU FEEL USED! HOW ABSOLUTE DARE YOU BE HURT THAT YOU FOUND OUT I STRUNG YOU ALONG AND I'M NOT AS GREAT AS I MADE MYSELF OUT TO BE! I'll probably expand on this later, but it's a working hypothesis. Guys, we're only four minutes into the episode, and just now we're getting around to introducing the film. And that opening interlude isn't really helping. In fact, it more or less contains everything he's going to say, and he already answered his question in it. However, if I stopped there, then people will start ranting about me being unprofessional. Ugh. Let's do this. Most of his starting commentary is just pinballing between praise, jabs that most animated films from the industry giants talk down to children, and joking that making the main character a chameleon is so he can be lost in a sea of vanilla protagonists because Rango starts off undefined. Keep that in your back pocket because this is going to come back and bite Doug. The car he's in swerves, and I guess they don't believe in backseat windows because he's yeeted out, and the conflict he said he needed to achieve an identity begins. Sorry, I have to nitpick again. The window was rolled down, not absent, and wait, did he just say yeet? Because he yeeted it out. I don't know why, but just hearing that come out of his mouth just sounds so unnatural. Damn it, I'm getting sidetracked. So he comments on Rango meeting the armadillo, and it's mostly just jabber about the PG rating and recapping the start of the chameleon beginning his quest. Soundtrack by Rango, Arizona? What movie are you trying to be right now? I'm not sure what the Rango, Arizona comment was supposed to be about, but if it's in regards to the soundtrack, dude, you need to listen to more mariachi music. I'm obviously not a musical expert, but a substantial amount of mariachi music or western scores that take inspiration from it has these vocalizations and yodels, for lack of a better term. Hell, anything with a more folksy sound has these vocalizations in there, and you want to take a guess as to why this is? It's because they're trying to get you into the setting of a western taking place in the southwestern part of the US. Close to Mexico, okay? 
At the very least, he's in the majority talking about the animation and character designs because this movie looks really good. Like, insanely good. The visuals in here keep aging like a fine wine. The textures are just that immaculate. You know what something in this movie is going to feel like if you touch it. The sound design helps sell everything, and the animation pulls it together with body language and individual quirks in the characters. As the celebrity live action references, or emotion capture as they call it. Instead of motion capture, it's kind of emotion capture. Jesus, Hollywood. Doesn't appear to add that much. At least with Polar Express, the idea was to make these people look and move more realistically to varying results, but that was the idea. Again though, these aren't people, they're animals, and they're designed so odd, I don't think they need them to move that real. And this is where Doug shoots his statements in the head, which is going to be a running theme of this review. This entire talking point right here is a perfect example outing himself that he really doesn't know what goes into animation without telling me he really doesn't know what goes into animation. Okay, so I'm going to get a little technical here, but when drawing or animating something, you can't always get by with just going off how you envision it in your head. Sometimes you need some references to get a better idea of how to compose something, finer details, timing, and so on. With posing and choreography, having your friends pose with props for a piece or a director having the actors roughly act out how the scene should go gives the project a reference to work off of that can then be adjusted in the sketching stage or animation pipeline. I don't think it's a crime or faux pas to call the technique emotion capture as the crew did in behind the scenes interviews. Plus, this is a subset of an animation technique called rotoscoping. If you look at this dancing walrus from Minnie the Moocher, or even the first Once Upon a Dream sequence from Sleeping Beauty set side by side with the respective behind the scenes feature, you'll notice that the actors were first filmed in a room with a couple of props for staging reference, and then that footage was used frame by frame to recreate that animation nearly one to one. With the advent of CGI in more recent animation history, we'd get motion capture which requires the actors to wear a rig that cameras and software track the movement of to create a near exact copy in the animation pipeline for more realistic movement. What's funny is that Doug brought up both the Polar Express and Mars Needs Mods, two films by Maker Image Studios that use motion capture for their animation. Motion capture itself has nothing to do with the art direction. It's just the movement of those models, which is why the characters in Polar Express look all right and everything is congress to how it moves, and Marcy's mobs looks like everything got stuck halfway through Revolution and the movement of these abominations isn't doing them any favors. Another use for motion capture is the rising number of VTubers, where the real person behind the scenes will use the rig while the capture software and virtual model will follow and track that rig in near real time. Obviously, this doesn't always go as planned, and you're going to have a number of buggy attempts while looking uncanny, so film productions with animation will just go the route of creating reference footage to use in the animation pipeline. And you know I was going to mention it eventually. It's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's Gorilla. By the virtue of being a virtual band with fictional musicians, the gang is no stranger to blending hand-drawn and CG animation with each other, and even even live action sets. I don't know how much reference went into the animation department in the earlier phases, but Jamie Hewlett's direction and competent art team makes the integration and motion fluid and solidly composed, especially when the cartoons are dicking around in the real world with real people. The stunt work for Stylo had to have been insane to pull off with a car chase in live action with real actors and the animated musicians together. The band did decide to dabble in motion caption later, and the humans era one saw a lot of bugging out to hilarious effect. Currently, I believe they're using the same rig as VTubers for the shorts with Murdoch talking about Cracker Island developments and for the Smirnoff Mixology event, but it looks a bit smoother and Murdoch's face isn't having a seizure. I would also imagine plenty of reference for choreographing the silent running video went into Noodle and Russell fighting off the Forever Cult and Murdoch attempting and compromising rescuing Tootie. Some stand-ins had to drape themselves in hats and blankets and even move around in ways that matched up with the size and conduct of the individual band members going in for the rescue. I don't know how much is true for 2D being tied up to the crucifix, but reference and stand-ins had to go into him interacting with the seats, wheelchair, and telephone box in the Cracker Island video. 
bringing my simping for this band back around to Rango's production, the actors on the mock-up sets may not be giving one-to-one -one performances of how the characters in animation would move in each scene in the final animation pass, but they're creating more of a template to work off of with the tone, line delivery, and interactions intact. For Christ's sake, this film was repeatedly cited and accused of motion capture usage when that's not at all what the animation process did and the film runners had to come out and say, no, this isn't motion capture, we just shot some really good reference choreography to use while building this. You can't just take the reference footage and the polished up final passes made from those references using the art direction and tweaks in mind and claim one part of the animation process is pointless or insinuate that it's pointless because you can only go so far filming real people before the animation needs to take over to bring out the fullest of those performances. If you guys couldn't already tell by my lengthy discussion of this particular point, I'm a little tired of Doug continually showing that he knows next to nothing about what goes into making convincing animation and the difference between the art direction and the actual movement or anything about convincing choreography and directing. The next Steven Spielberg, my ass. Needless to say, a lot of this imagery is so surreal and otherworldly that it really does thrive when it just gives into the weirdness, which it's continuing to do when he meets his female co-star, Beans. Not played by Helena Bottom Carter. You mean they're not conjointed twins? No, 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 Doug. The joke goes that Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter's co-star on a lot of projects is an odd way of Tim Burton hinting at wanting a three-way. You missed a crucial ingredient to that joke. It's not my best, but it's funnier than anything coming up. But knowing what's coming up, I'm going to regret this joke. And is instead played by... Uh, is it Isla or Esla? I better look it up online and see how other people pronounce it. Esla Fisher! Oh, that sweet honey from Wedding Crashers! Oh, he seems trustworthy. Oh, go! Fuck yourself, you narcissistic chode! I know he pronounces her name correctly afterward, but using himself as a reliable source, even as a joke, makes me a special kind of pissed. Your joke doesn't work because you've been exposed as a narcissist who only sees value in your own stuff and the idea of checking someone else is laughable to you and we know by now that your idea of research is the class slacker that just goes with the first Google search result. This is how you do a joke using your old work as a source or a possible source. There's just so many selections that I can't pick. I'm, I'm gonna look up and see what other people have said. Oh hey, maybe this guy can help me figure this one out. Bit dramatic calling them torture porns. We're not like doing Saw here, thankfully. But let me see what you got. Some viewers may find this disturbing. Your discretion is advised. One eternity later. This man is an idiot and you shouldn't listen to a damn thing that he says. It's not that hard! Oh, God, spare me now. He starts talking about Bean's defense mechanism where she'll suddenly lock up out of nowhere, which is an actual defense mechanism in some animals to dissuade a predator from further investigating them. Basically, if you stop moving and stay perfectly still, Whatever was considering making a snack out of you or seeing you as a threat will lose interest in further investigation and leave. And this is the part where I knew this was going to quickly become one of the hardest videos I've ever done. I made a community post following my first viewing of this review where I said something to the effect of it damn near breaking my personal policy of no politics. I may look into some channels that are more versed in it just to get an idea of what the hell is going on in current events, but that's not the point of this video. This joke is not funny. Whatever you think of the politicians he was taking jabs at with this joke isn't that important and I'm not here to tell you what to think about them. Pointing out or hinting at certain events like a movement that started with good intentions but quickly became a witch hunt to go after people the ones in the movement simply didn't like can color interactions in this movie a certain way is tacky. Hindsight may be 2020, but there's no way anyone can predict how interactions like this will be seen in the future. The only thing I will say that shouldn't have to be said is yes. Harassment is bad, no matter who it's coming from. And yes, you should come forward to authorities first if you find yourself in such a situation and in any actual danger. Mistakes can happen while sorting it out, but you'll do yourself more favors if you stay honest and transparent about any misconduct than if you make a media circus out of it. 
The other bit about Doug making jokes like this is that we're now five years out from the Not So Awesome document release. A document where several former producers came forward to air grievances about things that happened with management behind the scenes and a response from Channel Awesome to said document. If you've been paying attention, harassment from higher ups and other producers was a regular complaint that resulted in the confirmation of Mike Ellis and the late Juwario being such sex pests the company has harbored and defended that the Walker brothers and Mashad knew they were harboring and defending. What I'm saying is Doug Walker isn't in a position to make these kinds of jokes, period. That suicide mission fetch quest for Sartana's guitar is looking pretty good right now. She takes him to the town of dirt, which at times can be creative, but other times is surprisingly underwhelming. What's fun about scenarios with little creatures is how they utilize their surroundings. I always love it in Rescuers or Arietti, all the various ways they use common objects as something else. Occasionally we get that, like cactus juice is literally a cactus and a Pepto-Bismol bottle is an outhouse. But most of it is just stuff in the human world except smaller. Like, who the hell is making small guns that actually shoot small bullets? Okay, not that many. Now I could let this go as a nitpick, but we're dealing with a setting where the anthropomorphic animals are just as evolved and humane as they are wild. It's simultaneously a society away from humans that makes use of their throwaways and a society that has become something humans themselves. Farms, tailors, and blacksmiths are established to be in this town, so it's not out of the question that a lot of firearms and ammo were made by animal blacksmiths and gunsmiths. It's a nitpick, but he's making it out to be a plot hole. Is there anything else about the bar scene I could talk about other than Herp Derp Nickelodeon Huber? Or complaining we only get to hear half of Rango's fib? Actually, on the latter, I'll leave Fairy Godmother to give him an answer. Use your imagination. We're only halfway through this episode, and Doug's just now finished recapping Act 1. Pass me a cup. But tell me, honestly, be 100% straightforward. Can't you tell from just this two seconds of film what the rest of the story is going to be? Water, Mr. Rango. You got it, don't you? You got it. You may not even think you do, but just take a guess what happens in the rest of the movie and you'll be correct. The mayor, played by Ned Beatty, is pretending to be good, but the twist is he'll be evil. He holds power because he controls the water, he has an evil plan to screw everybody over, and he's gonna use Rango in his plan because he's popular, and the rest follows the liar reveal story already set up. Be honest. Be honest! You got all of that from just that two seconds, didn't you? And look, a predictable story is not bad if a lot of new things are done with it. But like I said, the coolest stuff was in the first third. Now it's just this run-of-the-mill story with no surprises. Well, somebody's accusing the film of holding his hand too much. The first time I saw this movie was during its theatrical run in 2011 when I was 15, and I did not see any of this coming. At best, I could pick up on Tortoise John being sketchy as all get out, only because I've taken enough history classes to know that way too many authority figures in a leadership position are subject to corruption and sometimes incompetence. But then again, after watching Monsters, Inc. enough times, you'd pick up on Water Noose being the true villain. Actually, let's talk about these two since they're cut from a similar cloth. This might just be me, but Water Noose always had an intimidating presence, even as far back as five-year-old me seeing Monsters, Inc. in theaters for the first time. Bossman isn't exactly someone you want to fuck with, even though he does have some more relaxed interactions with Sully, a clear favorite employee. Most of his interactions are conducted in a manner of seriousness and curtness associated with professionalism, and that's not exactly what I'd call warm or inviting. Waternoose's main presentation is that of a man at the top and has a lot riding on how he runs things with the toughness and an inherent scariness of being someone your job's fate is at the mercy of. When the twist comes that he's been running criminal exploits like the scream extractor and the kidnapping of children to keep it a viable tool, that presentation is still consistent with boss man you don't want to fuck with, now with upping his aggression to keep the operations under wraps. Even then, Waternoose actually felt bad that he had to banish and silence Mike and Sully when Boo was discovered. It wasn't until after the duo got back to the corporation to rescue Boo and quickly get her back home that all bets were off. With Tortoise John, sure, they cut the casual angle with having a favorite, but all interactions between him and Rango are still cordial and professional. He'll get agitated if someone questions his orders and authority, but any aggression is passed off to a designated muscle that he can work with. 
be it Bad Bill and the other goons working under him or Rattlesnake Jake. Unlike Sully showing the ability to hold his ground against Water Noose when it hits the fan, Tortoise John doesn't think Rango would pose that much of a threat to fight back, whether before or after the chameleon has been exposed as a fraud. Not really my best example, but something interesting to think about and show that Tortoise John being an obvious villain isn't as bad as Doug's making it out to be. The next minute or so is a bunch of jumbled observations like Beans and Angeline throwing snide remarks in the water ritual where Rango doesn't get an answer for what the hell is going on. In regards to the water ritual, they do answer it somewhat in the film itself. The citizens of Dirt gather at noon every Wednesday in the hopes of receiving hydration not too dissimilar to regular Sunday church service. For anything deeper than that, it's going to have to be treated kind of like Soliana's Festival of the Sun where the god Solaris is worshipped. It's part of the culture, no one in Soliana questions it because it's a normal occurrence. Obvious parody in Looney Tunes level of comedy sequences get some praise from Doug, but that's because he's watched a steady diet of Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry with barely any deviation unless it's another show like the 1980s Ninja Turtles and Animaniacs that take these tropes and successfully replicate them. For the love of donuts and everything that is holy, please watch a different show, Walker. Now, let's talk about forgettable side characters because this ramble really annoys the piss out of me. Like I said, scenes like this do give a bit of charm, but there aren't that many in between the stale plot and forgettable side characters. And there are a lot of side characters to forget. I don't remember any of these folks' names or personalities outside of this one with an arrow in his eye. I think the reason being there's an arrow in his eye. Even this child played by Abigail Breslin. Again, I saw this movie when I was 15, and for a good few months after, the character design still stuck out. I could very well pick the characters out of a lineup and tell you their exact quirk and even their names, though names are something we don't hear too often, and that's definitely the film's fault. Fine. But let's go down the line. In just the posse, I could pick out Waffles for being a horned lizard and kind of a derpy boy, the Colorado River Frog bartender, Doc being a medic rabbit with an ear missing, Spoons for his distinct voice and musical spoons, the one with an arrow in his eye is Sergeant Turley, and I gotta give Wounded Bird some clever credit for being a Crow Indian. I'm probably exposing myself as having not seen a lot of westerns to begin with, despite my dad having a lot of them in his collection, but I'm willing to take a guess that not a lot of side characters in those get much of a name drop. And Priscilla is precious. I'd die for this child. So then, given how distinct these designs are and the associated quirks, I'm going to have to ask you to butt the shuck up about forgettable and cliché. And to respond to your make the kid the villain if you want originality points take, what the hell is stopping you from making your own western where that happens besides the fact that you cannot write a good plot or joke to save your ass? Don't lie to me! You've made three average at best movies, a failed Be Kind Rewind knockoff, and several sketches that prove it. You'll be in charge of all tracking and finding the villains, utilizing your well-developed ingenuity. No offense. None taken. In 2011, 10 years from now, maybe. What? What I'm doing is baiting Twitter. I know it's baiting Twitter, but I'm going to do it anyway while nodding my head around like a mental patient as we fade to commercial. That suicide mission bus fight with El Malverde is looking pretty good right now. Rango gets a group together to find the robbers and keeps consulting with the engine crow. Pick up trail. Three men heading west. One blind. One with a large prostate. Riding side saddle. Depp studied his authenticity for when he played Tonto. What? Rango has another awkward as hell encounter when Bean freezes up again and he kisses her. We're still going by 80s college comedy rules, right? The following day they find the robbers and dress up like a theater group to trick them. Have I mentioned yet the funniest characters are the band? I think they're thespians. Thespian? Th that's illegal in seven states. How has Twitter not canceled this yet? Enough! Guys, this episode is really testing me. We're up to four, arguably five, jokes that do nothing but serve as Twitter bait because the world has just lost its goddamn mind that much from a guy who plays this card only when it'll bolster his ego and image. For the record, I don't like talking about these things because it's exhausting, and no matter how feet on the ground and level-headed I try to look at it, one side or the other is going to scream bloody murder about condoning it. 
I don't think anyone behind this film was actively trying or intending to do harm to whatever groups and situations they portrayed in it, and Doug trying to bait a certain group into throwing it to the wolves is irresponsible. It's the kind of overreaction that keeps the likes of extra credits in business can continue pushing out smooth brain takes that kill comedy in all reasonable discussion. It keeps giving ammo to Puritans. In this case, it's giving ammo to the Puritans that grew up on Tumblr that have to keep pointing out how every stupid little thing under the sun is offensive to someone somewhere and that people need to stop engaging with it like yesterday because it's literally killing people in the streets, don't you know? Once again, I'm not telling people how they should feel about these uncouth instances. I'm just telling you to use your discretion and not blow it out of proportion. You wanna know something that'll come back when I get to the bigger points? Rango came under controversy not because of depictions of certain groups or interactions that could be seen as creepy, but depictions of smoking and drinking. Because, yeah, having a western, which takes place in rural areas, where smoking and drinking are common practice, having characters smoke and drink is too much for the audience. And believe me, this has been slow cooking for some time now, so you know when I'm going to finally address it, it's going to be ex exceptionally juicy. More talk about the chase scene where it's pretty much him equating it to batshit wacky wily coyote hijinks and we get one of the most ignorant rambles ever to come out of this geed. They capture the robbers but discover the water jug was empty before they stole it. Let's get to what the kids really want. Conversations about capitalist expansion. I was here before the highway split this great valley. Control the water. And you control Begin everything. to appreciate the broad sweep. You attribute Fist. divine power to what me. What are you building out here? The future, Mr. Wright. The frontier town, the lawmen. There's just no place for them. Anymore. I watched the march of progress. Yeah, is this where you thought we'd be an hour after watching that? Even if you're a little kid seeing this cliche for the first time, why would this be entertaining to you? Okay, I'm going to keep the bigger issue at hand on that slow cook some more and address something that completely flies over this Laudite's head. This whole sequence regarding Tortoise John's vision for the future and the eventual collapse of dirt is an obvious discussion of how you can't stop progress and evolution and you have to adapt in order to survive. If that means leaving the antiquated staples of an era behind, so be it. And may God have mercy on you if you try to keep the old ways alive when they're not only incompatible with the new era, but refuse to assimilate. Another way to look at it, it at least from my personal interpretation, is a meta-commentary on the death and all but complete abandonment of the Western genre. Westerns had their time in the limelight for a good while during the 1950s when they were at their peak. The stories of gunslingers riding through the desert, taking the law into their own hands, are to the most iconic of Americana as legends of samurai on horseback slashing down foes in the feudal era are to essential Japanese culture, or tales of knights in shining armor valiantly storming a castle to slay the dragon and win the lady fair to classic European iconography. But as years went on and the genre became sad, Saturated, people started losing interest. Technology kept advancing. We became captivated with outer space as the first astronauts set foot on the moon. Sprawling cities with towering skyscrapers became more appealing, and the Western started dying. You can still find plenty of old shows and novels about the cowboys of the Old West, but good luck finding any new ones that aren't a parody or deconstruction and opt to play it straight. Westerns were losing viability for return on investment and aren't the hip cool thing anymore. Why continue keeping the Wild West alive when the rest of society has moved on? I could tell you why it's important to preserve the Western genre and still give it a shot in storytelling if that kind of thing strikes your fancy, but right now I'm just absolutely gobsmacked that Doug didn't get the bigger picture of this particular sequence. Now, we can talk about Doug doing my guy Rattlesnake Jake dirty. Suspecting Rango is getting too close, he calls Rattlesnake Jake, played by Bill Nye. This is another character that's written dull as a rock, but I'll give him this. He looks and sounds pretty intimidating. Hello, brother. Thirsty. Do you fear fangs? Listen close, you pathetic fraud. This is my town. 
good thing Bill Nye was there as a reference, too. He moves exactly like a snake. See why this was kind of dumb? First, I'll redirect anyone who missed it back to my extended spiel about using references in animation because I've lost my patience for this man queefing all over the process that goes into this art form. Second, this is something I'll probably have to talk about more in the Osmosis Jones and Inside Out Q&A, but if you're going to recap the introduction and presence of a key villain or antagonist of a film, fucking talk about them. Rattlesnake Jake has been built up for a substantial amount of the film as a force no one wants to fuck with, albeit one that we have to get exposition from other characters on. He's described as more of a force of nature and that you don't know when he'll show up, how much carnage he'll bring, and death is always left in his wake. Diamondbacks are one of the most dangerous reptiles you could come across in the American desert. How do you not think to make one of the most feared outlaw in the Old West? And there's also what Jake does for Rango's character development. Earlier, I said I would come back to the choice of making the main character a chameleon, and I don't see any better time to bring that back out for discussion. Rango starts off failing to physically blend in with most situations he comes across, but he gets especially skilled at blending in socially. He's the definition of fake it till you make it. At this point in the film, with everything going on and trying to figure out the water mystery, Rango has gotten so good at this that he's bought into his own act, but there's some key ingredient that's missing here. That's when Jake gets thrown into the mix, an outlaw with a definite reputation that knows what he is. It's that ultimate stress test for Rango to start questioning how deep he's gotten in and the point of no return. Rango, presented with the true threat that's heard of him and his tall tales, ends up cracking under the weight of the image he set up for himself and being shown to the town that the Emperor has no clothes. And it's pretty ironic that as much of a threat that Jake poses, liars are where he draws the line. All right, roll the sniper. Professionals have standards. And I suppose that segues directly into Rango's blue screen of death and how much Doug thoroughly missed the entire point. Say what you want about the sequence going on for five minutes, but the imagery and score as Rango trudges through the desert is absolutely sublime. The time lapse of the stars and cactus blooms give you that feeling of time being distorted as everything came crashing down to give Rango his time to ruminate. He finds his possessions from the terrarium he was thrown out of just days ago to realize that those friends are as imaginary as his old life now that he's interacted with real folks in far more real conversations. Rango comes to realize that he was living a lie, both as a theater-loving pet and as the man with no name that came out of the desert that a whole town came to count on. And the best part about this sequence? Rango, knowing he's a fraud with nothing going for him, starts crossing the road, not even bothering to keep a lookout for the cars and trucks passing through. He doesn't get hit once. No cars swerve out of the way. I mean, not that they'd even notice a chameleon that size anyway. And he doesn't care if he lives or dies, but he makes it to the other side, accepting he has passed the event horizon as a result of his own ego, all with visuals and minimal dialogue. It's an extended, quiet moment that I think does more and better than any of the hallelujah moments in the Shrek films, which is the term coined by Shea Frillis Productions for sequences where Shrek is alone and about to lose all the good things in his life as an appropriately fitting sad song soundtracks it. And those are some damn good phenomenal scenes! Going back to my earlier theory about how good liar revealed plots hold up a mirror to Doug Walker and show him what he really is, I'm inclined to believe that this scene not only flies over his head, but he actively refuses to engage with it. If he did, he would have to admit that he's an awful person who took advantage of people in a similar fashion and show some honest introspection, genuine soul searching, and after admitting the truth is uncomfortable, that the only way to change it is to improve himself as a person and improve his craft. But he's not going to. He's far too narcissistic to do such reflection and make any meaningful change and lacks empathy, a topic I'm sure I'll have to do an eventual follow-up on or address in a future rebuttal video. And also, fuck you for your joke about Johnny Depp. The man isn't a saint, but he didn't deserve any of the shit Amber Heard put him through, or being thrown under the bus as he was by Disney and other possible companies after it was shown that Amber Heard was the monster in the situation. I will say the redemption arc is a little creative. He encounters the Spirit of the West, again possibly on the verge of death, and it turns out to be Clint Eastwood. I also like that the idea is he has to check his ego, like it's not about him, it's about these other people he should help. That's what gives him his identity. Not necessarily what he thinks, but what he does. 
For what it's worth, at least there's some headway in him giving credit where credit is due with the encounter with the Spirit of the Rest, being personified as Clint Eastwood, portrayed by Timothy Olfant. He's at least getting that Rango's ego may have gotten him into the situation, but he still has the fundamental of doing the right thing for others. Had Rango been a more funny or interesting character in a less standard and convoluted story, this would have been a lot more powerful to me. Half credit only because he just keeps holding a stock story beat against the movie. One more time for the people in the back. Tropes are tools. They can be used to cut celery or they can be used to cut fingers. Also, real quick, you see this cut right here? I did not edit this footage at all. There's literally a gap that someone missed in the video editing. I guess that weekly upload schedule is finally catching up with him the same way the three-year production cycle is catching up with Pokemon. It gets weirder when these trees that look like Ents fuck Sneed start moving towards where the water is going. Sorry, I know I'm nitpicking, but those aren't trees. Those are Spanish daggers, a type of yucca that gets confused for being a cactus. They're even referred to as such by the characters. I swear, this man calls them trees, not just for a reference joke no one even gets, but because the only cactus he can think of is the iconic saguaro cactus. I took botany in high school and my dad has seen quite a few desert plants. I am losing my shit. And that city? That's Las Vegas, you twat. Open your eyes. Again, no explanation why these trees can walk or if it's a hallucination. It just sort of happens. And goddammit, I wish there was more of it. I want this movie to explain less, to think outside the box, to be that film you couldn't easily explain. But whenever it gets close, it returns back to its safe space of getting everybody to love him again. You know, considering the many times Doug accuses this film of holding his hand when it clearly isn't, does anyone here think that after years and years of media consumption that this guy not only failed to internalize any of it, but thinks he's four parallel universes ahead of everyone and that he's better than the plebs because of how much media he's consumed? Rango has one bullet left in his mouth, but Beans accidentally swallows it and freezes up again. One last bullet to kill one last outlaw. How bad does this look? Uh, I guess not bad enough. Oh, screw off! But wait, what about that stuff about Rango dying? Although he is certain to die, perhaps from a household accident, the people of the village will honor his memory. Okay. That is so lazy, I kinda love the shit out of it. I think that's the joke that's been building the whole time. The mariachi owls themselves this whole film weren't confident Rango would make it out of the story with his mortal coil intact, but he did! And I don't see that as talking down to an audience. And just like with his closing summary from the Powerpuff Girls movie review, this one is as close as we're going to get to any semblance of an actual review and summation of his thoughts on the movie, but it ends up shooting the last 20 minutes in the head. I'm all for inviting the audience to check something out for themselves to form their own idea and opinion on something, but that's not how you should be closing out a review if so much keeps flying over your head. What this movie was ultimately trying to do was use the western template to be a love letter to the genre while also putting together something fun and artistic that also goofs around with a lot of the tropes. Considering what Doug considers a love letter to existing media and that Yosemite Sam vs. Bugs Bunny cartoons but cranking up the mature audience's warrant is what he was probably expecting out of this, I don't think anyone's going to be sore with me when I say that this movie is just too much for him to digest. And now, for the thing that I said I had slow cooking several times, it's finally time to turn the heat off, peel back that foil, and let's get into this juicy, immaculate roast. Cool. I'm gonna cut into this and give it a try. Get some of that wine sauce all over the bacon. Oh, struggle a little bit. And it turned out really good. Kids movie, kids movie. Children's western, kids movies, kids movies, kids film, family film. Kids film, get to what the kids really want. Even if you're a little kid seeing this cliche for the first time, kids film, kids audience, kids film. This is not a kids movie. Kids can watch it, but there's so much in there that they won't be able to appreciate until they're older. There's a bunch of things in here that definitely aren't kid-friendly, like the aforementioned drinking and smoking that isn't hidden in innuendo that both the good guys and the bad guys partake in, murders and deaths around this whole story, jokes far more geared towards adults, 
guns, swearing. Hell, I'd even say that the Wild West is no place for kids, period, and that one of my favorite Nickelodeon cartoons of all time consistently portrays it as such. It may have a bunch of goofy moments that kids would definitely get a laugh out of, but Rango is made to be more for the adults, and it was made more for the adults in the sense of its maturity. All too often, media aimed at adults that deliberately or by chance go the animated route have the idea that being mature and adult is being a dick, getting drunk or stoned off your tits, being mega horny, splashing every frame with blood for the sake of it, and swearing frequently to the point of using fuck as a comma. This even applies to things that I actually like, like Has Been Hotel When It's Good, South Park, and so on. There's more to being an adult than this. Adult media that can still be enjoyed by kids is able to talk about so much more, like the meaning of life, ambitions, self-discovery, the painful truth that not everything can be wrapped up nicely with dancing off into the sunset, dealing with death and loss, what it means to be human, pretty much every event and facet of the human experience you can think of is available to paint with. Rango feels more in line with Ratatouille, The Incredibles, Soul, The First Ten Minutes of Up, The Iron Giant, phenomenal works of art that speak more to adults but are still enjoyable for kids. There have literally been essays about how animation is the perfect medium to do anything and everything, no matter who it's aimed at. Brad Bird is the most vocal about standing up for the art form as a medium, but the animation genre, quote unquote, rants could be a video all in some. And it already is by people who put it into far better words than I could ever hope to. Rango is able to get away with as much adult stuff as it has because it's written more adult than its industry cohorts. Sure, you could rework it into a live-action film with humans instead of animals, but you'd lose part of its artistic identity, and when the more cartoony or shenanigans pop up, they just wouldn't be done justice. And every time Doug calls this a kid's movie, I'm only left wondering if it's strictly because it's animated and came out of Nickelodeon, of all places. It's a kick in the teeth to this movie and the medium as a whole, and it only starts cementing the theory that Doug Walker does not respect animation as an art form that can do anything. He may have given praise to things like Tom and Jerry, South Park, and Secret of Nim, but if this is how he's going to go about something that uses the medium for mature, artistic western, then this review is an even bigger slap in the face to those. Every time Doug calls this a kid's movie, it further reinforces the animation age ghetto. A trope I am sick of, that pigeonholes the medium as something only kids can enjoy, and the second it decides to make something for adults that treats them as thinking adults with themes and materials that children absolutely cannot handle, it gets attacked by the Karens of the world that expect the television and iPad to raise their hellspawn instead of being an actual fucking parent. Insert Blame Canada reference here. I know trying to get Doug to understand or think critically about stories that have a more metaphorical approach or use more symbolism and allegory is a lost cause at this point. That said, when you're the face of internet film criticism for better or for worse, and you can't digest anything more complex than a Roadrunner cartoon, why should anyone take your more worldly take seriously? The saying, a broken clock is right twice a day, would be applicable to Doug if he didn't keep going back on his words and shooting any credibility he had and fair points he makes in the head and deflecting legitimate criticism that comes his way. And that was Nostalgia Critic's review of Rango. Butter, tasting biscuits, and sausage gravy, this was a massive disservice to the movie. I don't know what he was expecting from it back when it came out, and I don't know what he was expecting upon revisiting it, but one thing's for sure, he definitely hasn't advanced his level of thinking beyond pointing out the tropes. I'm not even going to entertain his bum reviews video on it because it would be redundant. The fact he doesn't get it and keeps writing it off as a kid's movie would be one thing, but factor in accusations of the movie holding his hand when it isn't, baiting Twitter to cancel this movie over things that are largely harmless if a bit awkward because of hindsight, and how the liar revealed trope in the story is done so well Doug is refusing to get on the therapy couch and actively engage with it, and that nightmare fuel thumbnail image becomes a warning sign of what you're in for. This goes without saying, don't watch Doug's review. I put myself through it for your entertainment and to warn you that the poor bastards who did weren't kidding about how bad it is. Instead, go to Rango, a bizarre masterpiece by Josh Keefe, or Rango is an underrated masterpiece by Bionic Pig if you want to know why this western experiment should be given the credit and respect it deserves. 
Or if you want to know what a newcomer thought of it, I'll send you again to Schaeferl's Productions. Specifically, his Best Picture Winners Ranked video where Harango managed to take the number 11 spot for reasons that I think are very fair and admirable. Links, of course, will be in the description. As for Doug, really the only thing I can sign off on is that the perfect adult, quote unquote, western for his taste is A Million Ways to Die in the West. Enjoy the tobacco juice, old boots, musty, family guys, soured Thanksgiving leftover taste of Seth MacFarlane's abortion of a film career. Thank you all for watching and have a good day. Except Doug, I hope you find a diamond back in your boots. If I ever see you again, I will take your soul straight down to hell.